Magic the Gathering has some of, if not the best, art in the gaming sphere. While some games like Warhammer do come close, no one is consistent in quality like Magic is. But with the scope to allow varied and interesting angles to approach towards their game, we have epic set pieces, but we also have whimsy and heartfelt moments. We have the abstract and we have the literal. Magic's art is varied, but consistently good. It's fucking excellent. But sometimes it doesn't all go to plan. Throughout Magic's history, we've had some suspect art direction. We've had some artists blunder themselves, either not understanding the assignment or kind of cheating on the assignment, if you will, copying other people's homework. And then of course, we've got situations where the art and the artist is not to blame, but the community acts like a bunch of fucking children. So in today's video, I'm gonna talk about when magic art goes wrong. And yes, that's dramatic. And yes, the video is probably called Magic Controversies, but blame the algorithm and blame yourselves for that. But first, a quick message from our sponsor. Today's video is brought to you by Ren. It is absolutely no secret that the world is on fire right now. Not literally, but almost. Climate change, the climate crisis is real. And whilst I don't believe we should be guilt tripping one another and that wider systemic cultural and political changes are needed, I do think that we can come together as a collective to help solve issues. This is the ad read, but stick around you bastards. It's important. This week's sponsor is Ren, a carbon footprint offset subscription service. You take a questionnaire about your lifestyle that helps you to understand just how much of a carbon footprint you have and that you are leaving behind. Mine is not good. I fly a lot for events and for work and compared to the average Brit, that does play on my mind a little. Ren offers you the ability to pay as little or as much as you want to offset your carbon footprint. And for that reason, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I probably can't keep this up every month and will lessen it in the future, but it makes me feel more comfortable to be doing something. And what is that something you might ask? Well, it's not just guilting you into recycling. Look, I'm going to be very, very real with you right now. The idea that it's all on personal responsibility is a manufactured piece of propaganda by oil companies to put the onus on us and not on them. Ren didn't tell me to say that, but I want to say that because I... I feel strongly about this. I want to make sure that people are aware of this. But this fact doesn't remove the personal responsibility that we all have to fix what is going on. I don't believe it should be a pressure to obsessively recycle, although recycling is obviously good before you tell me in the comment section about that. Ren's goal is to take the money you put in and put it towards a wide variety of green initiatives, from funding policy and activist groups like Clean Air Task Force to developing and pushing for the use of biochar and aquaculture. These are wide-ranging changes and causes that if we get behind them collectively can make a difference. You can start to offset your own carbon footprint today on Ren with the link in the description below. The first 100 people to sign up all have an extra 10 trees planted in their name. It helps to support the channel and it helps to support a cause we should all care about. Right then, let's begin with lemurs or lemurs or lemurs. Do you know what a lemur is? Do you? Do you know what a lemur is? Whilst Ice Age Block was being made, artist Richard Thomas was sent an art brief for the card Hippolyterus Lemur. Yep, that's right. I have no idea how you're meant to pronounce this fucking thing. It was referencing a creature called a lemur or lemur, something drawn from D&D and fantasy, a spirit trapped on this world, unable to leave. Of course, Richard thought, like I would, that he meant, that the art director meant uh, lemur, you know, the actual real world mammal. Thus, we got this card. Years later, we got a call back to Lemures in Time Spiral with a card depicting them accurately, I guess, with a playful bit of flavor text from Gnawing the Worry suggesting that they were harmless until engaged or close to. Basically, I see this as a callback to the harmless looking Lemures of the past. Personally, I would love to see a third Lemur, Lemur, whatever the fuck you pronounce it like in Magic that is, again, looks like the mammal but with wings. I think that'd be a really fun full circle callback to when an artist just didn't know what the fuck the art director was talking about because they don't live in a fantasy world. And this is not the first time either and surely will not be the last. Mystic Remora, a commander staple and frustrating Magic card for many a player, it wasn't originally meant to be an actual thing. Fish. Remora has two separate definitions, one being a type of sucker fish and the other being a hindrance or drag. The interesting thing here is that the etymology of the name of the fish might be from the same root origin in Latin, where remora is the Latin word for delay, as ancient superstition of sailors held that these fish would suck on the bottom of boats and delay them or slow them with their supernatural powers. Either way, Mystic Remora was never meant to actually be a fish, 
but it's fun that it is a fish, right? And that legendary miscommunication lives on in the most recent update to the card in the recent Secret Lair uh, product, where we're getting an actual fish, Mr. Amora, again. That said, all of this aside, there's no excuse for it not being in the Commander Legends product. That's kind of a topic for a different video. People on Twitter were saying to me, like, you know, do these fish exist in the Forgotten Realms? Could they have been in Battle for Baldur's Gate, Commander Legends 2, Electric Boogaloo? And to that I say, firstly, yes. There's magic fish in D&D for fuck's sake. It's D&D, &D, it can be anything you want. And secondly, yes, because magical hindrances also exist. Mystic Amora should have been in Commands and Legends 2 and you cannot change my mind. One final and rather fascinating example of this kind of miscommunication comes in the form of John Avon not knowing, at least initially, what a Drake is. And yes, I mean that John Avon, the legendary magic artist. Early on in his time with magic, he was tasked to paint something depicting a lightning bolt hitting a drake. The story goes that he painted a bolt hitting a male duck, because male ducks are known as drakes. The story has now bloomed into this... Oh, come on, wizards, show us the original art. If that art exists somewhere, we want to see a secret lair where a duck is being hit by a lightning bolt. The art itself ended up being for pyrotechnics. When it was corrected, it saw print. Here we see it. I think this card has some great art. John Avon is fantastic. The 7th edition version has like a brighter hue to the background like atmosphere, and I like it a lot. It's my favourite pyrotechnics art. But the 7th edition version, I only noticed this today, you can see the water. I think that adds so much more to the art as well. So, for the record, if any of you cared, are you taking notes? Pleasant Kenobi's favourite pyrotechnics art is the 7th edition version. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. Next, what happens when your average Magic the Gathering player thinks they're really good at something they've never ever tried? And no, I'm not talking about your average commander player chiming in about the ban list in standard. And no, I'm not talking about your average standard player thinking they know how legacy works. I'm actually talking about Magic players thinking that they're fucking artists. It all leads to a fucking weird backlash about Faithless Loot. I've done an entire video talking about this particular controversy around uh, Carly Mazur's evocative of wildly out there Faithless Looting art. It utilizes block colors and unconventional techniques to create a far more abstract version of Faithless Looting than your average Magic player was used to or was expecting. Don't forget the, the art of Magic, one of the criticisms of it is that it has become homogenized over time to look like a cohesive world where there's a lot of digital art involved and it's got a very photo real to look to a lot of conventional magic at least up until recently where they've embraced alternative arts through secret layers and um, alternate frames like the Strixhaven mystical archives but the backlash began primarily on reddit spilling over to twitter and other places that this art was just pure crap it was just bad. People took to insulting Carly's art directly and openly, which is kind of a bit shitty. You gotta be careful with this stuff a bit. They are human beings making the shit at the end of the day. And people claiming that they could, given the time, do better than this on Photoshop. Hell, they were claiming it looked like a bad Photoshop. Of course, rather tellingly, none of them actually did any better. No one made a better version of them. I think the art is wonderful in being so far outside of what you come to expect, and it fit the thematic concerns of the mystical archives perfectly. It looks like an illustration in some sort of crazy magical text. If you want a larger, more immediate unpacking of the controversy at the time, I'll link the old video in the description below where I talked about it. And on a similar note of parts of the community losing their fucking minds over nothing and having a video unpacking it a bit more closer to the actual time myself, let's talk about Bearscape real quick in a little, not as much detail because there's a video on it, but I think this fits in the same category, right? Bearscape was brought back for Pride Month and it showed some men of the bear body type, uh, gay men, we would assume, being being close and intimate with lovers in a hot pool. In short, many a person claimed it was sexualizing magic and they saw an injustice in that because the sexualization of women has been lessened in recent times. And whilst I agree that it has been, we've stopped just bimboifying and having the male gaze inform what we see of women and male artists sexing them up. I don't think sex is completely absent from magic in general. And beyond that as well, we have to then unpack the idea that men being cosy with their partners who are also men in a hot tub is inherently sexual. Which I would say, it is not. I think we just have to come to terms with the fact that intimacy exists between hetero couples and gay couples and move on with our lives. Full video linked in the description below. Let's move on to the next one. From one form of angry bigotry to another, Magic the Gathering's parent company, Wizards of the Coast, banned seven cards from Magic for having controversial or racially insensitive themes and artwork back in the summer of 2020. Whilst there is certainly some questions to be had around the choices and the lists, whether they really warranted full deletion from the game at large, and whether the gesture was performative or not, one of the bands in particular made a lot of sense to me and kind of justified the rest. Invoke Prejudice is a fucking wild 
wild card. And I don't mean that in that it does a cool and interesting thing, I mean that how the fuck did this exist for so long? Its name, Invoke Prejudice, also tells us immediately what the flavour of the card will be. In short, it stops creatures that don't share a colour with those in play right now from entering the battlefield unless a tax is paid. That's a pretty fucking rough start, I will admit. Well, it just gets worse. The art evidently has some KK-esque hoods in it and an execution of acts accompanying that, which in itself invokes some rather questionable ideas. And then find out that the original artist, Howard McNeil, is a literal fucking neo-Nazi, and well, things go from an oof to one of the largest what the actual fucks in magic history. I am not going to be showing any of the artist's non-magic art because it's all really fashy and Nazi. He literally glorifies Hitler and other Nazi ideas in his art. He's a Nazi. There's no... It's not, this isn't just someone on Twitter calling someone else a Nazi they disagree with. He literally is. And whether it's a wild cosmic coincidence or some purposeful shitty fucking joke on the part of the people involved with the naming and numbering of cards, the Invoke Prejudice also had an assigned gatherer number, so a number in their database, the official Wizards Online database, of 1488, which I'm not going to unpack in great detail, but you just need to know that it's important to Nazis. It invokes the 14-word slogan, and it uh, shows a reverence for that cunt Hitler. It is beyond fucked up that this thing survived for so long even as a relic of our past it is still there as a relic of our past no one has gone out and burnt all the cards so some of the backlash about you know not respecting history or some shit is completely irrelevant what has happened is a corporation in america has decided in the present day here in 20 or 2020 but 2022 to not allow fashy nazi shit in their game and i for one applaud them for that of course there were some brave internet individuals who stood against the tyranny of a modern day company not wanting to allow Nazi shit in their games and claim that everyone's being a snowflake. I think the real snowflake are people who get upset when we throw out shit like the KK Clay and Nazis. Fuck that shit. Fuck those people defending it. And then on the topic of idiocy and weakness, let's talk about plagiarism. Crux of Fate, another controversy involving Strixhaven's mystical archives. Oh, weird. Crux of Fate by Jason Felix looked great, right? I wasn't going to nominate it for any awards, but it looked decent enough for a wrath. But then we found out it was a shopped version of previously drawn Nicobolos art of a piece of fan art, no less. It turned out that Felix had taken a piece of fan art of Nicobolas and um, Raymond Swanland's uh, original Ugin art for the uh, card from Cannes and kind of like shot them around and moved the arms a little bit and basically composed a piece of art in a hasty rendition of it in a, what amounts to plagiarism. Now, I do believe there is an element of transformative art that can be done with other people's work. And I do believe that you can also composite art from existing assets. That's a whole different branch of art in itself. That's, fuck it, that's how collages can work, right? But this was not that. This was a paid artist cribbing from another paid artist, but also taking literal shit from a fan artist, someone who's not in the ecosystem and not getting paid by Wizards of the Coast in any capacity to provide art for magic. That's a lot different from creating a transformative piece using other people's, or parts of other people's art. The art itself was taken from a Twitter user and illustrator for hire called Scary Pet on the internet, also known as Kit. People now even get them to sign their cruxes of fate in a weird twist of fate. Jason Felix publicly admitted to cribbing from Kit, Scary Pet, and Raymond Swan's Ugin, and by cribbing I mean literal copying, <laughs> pasting, they explained that they were overworked, so it was a moment of weakness in all fairness, but they even admit themselves that's no excuse. Whilst I do believe redemption is an important part of the human experience, I think people can learn from their mistakes 100%. Hell, I wouldn't actually kick up a fuss if Jason Felix was invited back to work for Wizards again, obviously on a one more strike and you're out kind of pro situation. But the, the point I'm getting at is that whilst a mistake was made that I think they can be redeemed from, there's still that sticking point of using an, another person's unpaid art and passing it off as your own. Unfortunately, a moment of weakness might have really damaged Jason Felix's career. And I feel sad because it's evident that they are still a talented artist, even if they did plagiarize during a moment of weakness when they were overworked. It was rough to see. I really hope Jason Felix has learned from that and recovered from it. And I hope their career wasn't too badly hindered. So from miscommunication to audience overreaction to literal fascism and right through to a moment of weakness where you plagiarised your colleagues and people who weren't getting paid like you were, that is some of the times that Magic the Gathering art has gone bad. 
Oh, we do love a bad boy, don't we? That's the video for today. If you enjoyed this, hit the like button and comment down below. Perhaps let me know if I've missed a controversial piece of magic art or something that happened involving magic art that you'd like to see unpacked in another video. In the meantime, fuck Nazis, trans rights are human rights, and I'll see you all the next one. Ta-ta for now.